My name is Jen and today I will be discussing Why Genders Matters by Dr. Leonard Sachs. So I usually do these videos in Swedish, but since I read this book in English, it would make more sense for me to do this review in English as well. So um, I will be posting Swedish subtitles. I don't know if I will post the Swedish subtitles when I post the video, but if I don't, I will post a notification on Twitter once it is translated. So you can go on and follow me over there on the Twitter if you want to get notified. So I've been very excited to read this book. Um, I think it is in my opinion, like when I started reading it, that um, Leonard Sachs is a true feminist. This is what feminism should really be all about. Um, there is a true biological difference that some people are actually trying to ignore. Uh, and the debate about the gender differences is very strange and so a book like this is very important. In this review I would be keeping very close to the source material so I might be posting some of the uh, studies that he is linking in the book underneath this video otherwise I would just... So you could either <laughs> look up just the studies or you could go ahead and buy this book. I was very pleasantly surprised when I started reading this book because not only is it very interesting it is also a very easy read. He kind of structured this book like he starts a chapter with some an anecdotal story basically and then he goes into the studies so he lays first the, he first lays the basic or the basis for why that topic is important to discuss and how that difference is can be applied in real life which makes it really interesting <laughs> and easily understood and the language he uses is very very good so in the first chapter of this book he kind of goes into why he decided to write the book Oh, here, let's, 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 let's discuss <laughs> who Leonard Sachs is. So, Leonard Sachs, MD, PhD, graduated P Phi Beta Kappa from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, at the age of 19, and then went on to the University of Pennsylvania, where he learned both a PhD in psychology and an MD. He completed a three-year residency in family practice in Lancaster, Philadelphia. Pennsylvania. So he does refer refer a lot to like past patients and past cases that he has been working with, uh, which is really helpful because it puts everything in perspective. But why he why he decided to write this book is he explains it as he was getting more and more concerned mothers into his practitioner's office, being concerned that their boys had ADHD, and he was like, why is that? Because he noticed that a lot of these boys didn't have ADHD. They were just, you know, they had an attention problem. Let's say, like they couldn't they couldn't focus in class, and they weren't they weren't learning in the same way that some of the girls were per se. And so he noticed that this problem is not going to be solved with you know taking medication, because he noticed that like some of the boys they would sit and. In class and they would have a female teacher and the teacher would talk in like you know a calm comfortable tone for her but turns out that the boys just couldn't hear her you know they were sitting kind of far back in class and of course you have an attention deficit problem then because you can't hear her and you're not gonna raise your hand when you're a six-year-old boy and be like hey miss um could you talk a little louder I can't hear you no they're not gonna do that you're just gonna start zoning out watching out looking out the window and you know thinking about other stuff like little boys do. Are you gonna put that boy on medication? No, I don't, that's not really a good solution. And you could say to the teacher, well, you should talk a little bit louder, or you could move the boys, maybe, up front, because research shows, shows that boys do have worse hearing than girls do. And so if the teacher would have known this difference, then maybe they could have done something about it. And he was talking to one of the moms, and the mom was like, you should write a book about this. And Sachs was like, well, there should be plenty of books about it. But as he started looking for it, he noticed that there really wasn't. And the books that were about gender and gender differences were, they were either about gender neutral child rearing, you know, like raising your child gender neutral, which he was like, no. Or there were, here, not only do most of the books currently print about girls and boys fail to state basic facts about innate differences between the sexes, but many of them promote a bizarre form of political correctness, suggesting that it is somehow chauvinistic even to hint that any innate differences exist between, between female and male, which is absurd. And then he does also point out that in the books that did show the differences, they were, you know, extreme on the other part, like on the other way, on the other side of the spectrum. They were like, well, you know, there are super differences between the sexes and therefore they should 
be raised completely differently and are meant for completely different things. And you know, so they weren't really a, you know, a normal book about it. Like this one, where you just explore the differences and how you can use these differences to make sure that the genders are equal. The gender and the sexes are equal and have the exact same opportunity. And if you know what things that girls struggle with, you can help them with that. Like maybe the things that boys are not struggling with as much or in the same way because we struggle in different ways, right? And that, and one other point that he brings out here is that often when we are in the current discussion that we're having about sex differences and gender differences is that, well, no two people are the same. So if you take, if you take two girls, those two girls could be vastly different. Uh, and about this he says, but the fact that each child is unique and complex should not blind us to the fact that gender is one of the two great organizing factors, organizing principles, the other principle being age. Without understanding the role of gender in child development, it's like trying to understand a child's behavior without knowing the child's age. And in many ways, the second grade girls were more like 25 year old women than like second grade boys. Now that's very interesting, right? And here, um, Sachs brings out an example of two girls uh, seven-year-old girls calls them Stephanie and Zoe and they seem very very different like they're like completely different things you know like one is a tomboy and one is like super girly or whatever but the thing is uh, he says despite their differences Stephanie Stephanie may share more with Zoe than you might imagine in their ability to listen in their visual system and in their willingness to affiliate with adults as we will see Stephanie may have more in common with Zoe than she has in common with her brother or with most boys. So there are significant differences in how we learn, how we see, how we, you know, visualize, how we hear, like how we are just structured differently in many ways. That has nothing to do with personality and what we choose to do. And so this video will be in a series uh, because there's a lot to unpack in this book that I want to unpack with you guys and I want to discuss with you guys. But I will be bringing out a bunch of examples of this. So there's the, um, the first chapter. And so the second chapter is called Smelling, Seeing, and Hearing. So as for the name, it's, it's going to go through these three subjects or these three areas. <laughs> the anecdotal story that he brings out here is really funny. Or it's very interesting, and I think a lot of us can learn something from it. He is the. It was a couple going. I guess. I guess it was a couple going to counseling. No, he was just saying there was just a couple that he knew. But um, anyways, this couple, uh, this family. So they were a couple, and they had some kids. I don't know. But they were a couple at least. Uh, so they um, they went on vacation, and when they came back, the wife smelled this horrid smell uh, in the apartment, and she was like, "What is that?" what what is what is this <laughs> you know and the husband couldn't smell anything and it went on for days like and the wife said that like the, the smell just got worse and worse and she got more and more upset at the husband for not noticing you know because she was like does he think i'm fucking stupid it smells awful in here it smells like death and so she obviously wanted someone to come in and do something about it, find the smell, you know, get rid of it. Get rid of whatever was dying in there because there obviously had to be because it was smelling so bad. And the husband was like, does she think I'm stupid? I'm not going to pay a bunch of money to get someone to fix this problem that's not even here. Um, because he couldn't, honestly, like he couldn't smell anything. And the wife, she was like smelling this smell every day and it was just getting worse and worse and worse. So what they didn't know is that men and women smell things differently. Uh, they have different smell capabilities. <laughs> Smelling capabilities. So Leonard Sachs then had to sit down with both of them and in different ways explain to them that to the wife, your husband is not stupid, he just can't smell it. And to the husband, he had to say, no, listen to your wife. There may be something there, just get someone to check it out. And so they did, and it turns out that there was actually two mice that were dead somewhere, laying in their own, you know, filth and smelling up the whole house. And so he says here, if you're a woman and your husband says he doesn't smell anything, don't call him a pig. Explain to him that even though he doesn't smell the horrible stench, you do smell it. And then work it out. Um, so uh, here he brings out the first study. So he says that Dr. Pamela Dalton and her colleagues exposed several men and women. 
yeah, expose men and women to several smells. And they would expose these, these groups to the smell uh, over a period of time, like multiple times. And what they noticed was that the, the women's ability to detect the smell would increase over time. Now this was not just like 50% or like 100%, no, this was 100,000 fold, like a bunch. <laughs> and they could not see this with the men, like for the men, none, no increase at all. So that's obviously a huge difference. And there is some science behind it that I'm not gonna like try to explain because I don't really understand it myself, so it would be kind of stupid for me to sit here and try to explain it, but I'll try to post um, a link to it below. But here, I'm gonna go and say, um, women have more cells in the olfactory bulb. Olfactory bulb is something with the nose. Uh, they have 16.2 million in the average woman compared with 9.2 million in men. So that's obviously a difference. When you look at just the neurons in the olfactory bulb, the average woman has 6.9 million compared with just 3.5 million in men. When you look at the glial cells, women have, again, more. They have 9.3 million and the men have 5.7. So, did you guys hear that? Why do they always have like this? So, and here he brings out another example. He went to a all-girls school, uh, an all-boys school in New Zealand where it's... Yes. Okay, so there were two schools. There was one school for boys and one school for girls. And so the, both of the schools had arranged a uh, optional curricular activity, which was ballroom dancing, where they would, the boys school and the girls school would come together and dance or whatever. But it turns out like, the girls would just not show up and people were obviously confused like why are you not like this is a fun thing and it turns out that the girls were just saying that like the boys just smell so bad that they could not deal with it they did not want to go because the boys just smelled bad so first London Sex talked to them and then he talked to the boys and he was like why are you guys not showering before do you guys not think you smell and they were like no why should we shower we don't smell and so they just didn't know. And what you can do with this information is, let's say that you have, you're a mother and you have a, uh, a son and you go into his room and it stinks in there. What you should not do then is go in there and be like, what is wrong with you kid? Clean your fucking room, you know? Um, which I hope no one talks to their son like that, but um, you know. <laughs> but what you should instead do is just ask them, hey, uh, do you think it kind of smells in here? And if they say no, then you need to explain to them, well, you know, it really does. Um, you should clean your room <laughs> and take a shower. Having a good, you know, explain what good hygiene is or whatever, because they might actually not have a clue that they smell bad, um, you know? Um, then he goes into hearing, I'm not gonna go into that. The next thing he goes into after hearing is seeing, and I really love this example that he brings out. So he says here, 20 years ago, a little boy named Andrew Phillips, which is actually his real name, he was going to a really good private school. There was mostly girls there, actually, but it wasn't like, you know, intentional, it was just how it was. And so one day the teacher was like giving the, the kids some crayons and some papers and was like, hey, uh, draw something. And the girls would, you know, pick up all the colors of the rainbow and they would draw flowers and houses and people, you know, and, and then little Andrew, he just, he picked out the black crayon and he started drawing and he drew two boys stabbing each other. And the teacher got upset at this. And she spoke to the mom, to this boy, and he was a six-year-old boy. And she was like, this, uh, this is not okay, you know? And the mom was like, dude, he's a six-year-old boy. What do you expect? And the teacher's response to that was that, well, that's the only reason why I didn't give him a referral. But the teacher would tell the boy was like, well, why can't you draw something else? Why can't you do something else? Look at all the pretty things that the girls are drawing. And that just kills the spirit of this little boy. He's like, well, he's not hearing, why can't you draw something else? He's hearing, why can't you be someone else? Why can't you, you know, why can't you be someone else? Why can't you like something else? And this just kills the spirit. Uh, so what the, what the mom ended up doing was switching him to an all-boys school. And their solution, they knew that boys were more likely to just draw action pictures, you know? 
uh, what happens when you give girls and boys blank pieces of paper and a box of crayons and ask them to draw whatever they want to draw? Researchers who have conducted such studies consistently find that girls are more likely to draw flowers and trees and pets with lots of colors. The people in the girls' drawings have eyes, mouths, no, <laughs> yeah, eyes, mouths, hair, and clothes. A few boys do draw pictures, just like the girls draw, but the great majority of boys draw pictures that are quite different from the girls' pictures. Most boys draw scenes of actions at a moment of dynamic change, like a monster getting an alien or a rocket smashing into a planet. It's normal. So what happens when you tell these boys that, that what they're doing is wrong or that they're not doing as good as the girls, you know, you're just pointing at what the girls are doing and look at how, how good they are, like, why aren't you like that, is that it automatically gets them turned off to drawing and this kind of feeds into the stereotype that drawing is a girl thing because the boys are not allowed to express their creativity in the way that they want to so they just start thinking that drawing is for girls and not something that they can do you know because they don't find it fun when they can't draw what they want to the lack of awareness of gender differences have this has the unintended consequence of reinforcing gender stereotypes while there may not be any innate differences in the ability to draw I do think the evidence demonstrates the big difference in what kind of drawings girls and boys want to draw. Now what we can do with this information is that instead of reprimanding the boys for drawing scenes of actions, we can instead remind teachers that the jobs of the teacher is to help the boy draw the picture he wants to draw and help him make it more vivid, more evocative of action. So yeah, drawing scenes of action is not going to turn the boy into a psycho killer, I don't know. Maybe you guys have some studies that show that it does, but um, I highly doubt that. So the third chapter we're going to get into, and the last chapter that I'm going to get into in this video, this, um, this will be a video series because, like I said, there's a lot to unpack here. This is a very exciting chapter. I was very happy to read this. Um, so this one is about risk. And I think that risk-taking is one of the things that the feminists in this discussion are actually willing to agree on, that girls are less likely to take risks. Or at least that's how I interpreted what some people are saying. Um, and there's a huge difference in risk-taking behavior. And there's a huge difference in the stigma of how risk is perceived between the genders. You know what? Scratch that. <laughs> We're gonna get into the third chapter uh, in the next video because that chapter was kind of long and I started talking about it and then I was like, no, I want to make more notes on it first. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for watching. Uh, please like and subscribe if you like this content. I will be posting videos of, on this book as I go along, like, I don't have time to write about it. Um, I post a new video every week, or at least I try to, so follow me here. If you're feeling generous, I have a PayPal. If you want to see more of me, I have an Instagram and a Twitter that will link down in the description. Yeah, thank you, bye!